Good evening and welcome to an all new episode of What the Friday. Now if you listened to this past Monday night's episode of Mystery, Murder, and Mayhem, you heard my explanation of my absence and in a nutshell I've had some health issues and several deaths in my family. So that had me away from the podcast for a little while. But speaking of health issues, if you're like me, you've heard the words, you need to lose weight coming from your doctor or others who are concerned when you have a health issue. Well, tonight's story is a little about weight loss, but not in the way that you think. I'm not telling you the secret of losing weight or anything like that. I'm bringing you this story of how a weight loss guru turned religious leader combined the two and the results were basically a cult. Welcome to What the Friday. The After Dark series presented by Mystery, Murder, and Magic. Listening discretion is advised. Have you ever heard the name Gwen Shamblin-Lara? Her recent death made the headlines and the story that surrounds her life leading up to her death is shocking and intriguing at the same time. So Gwen was born and raised in Tennessee, and you know how we are here in the South and really around the world, we love food. If somebody dies, we bring food for the family. If something awesome happens, we celebrate with a big meal with like desserts and drinks and all that good stuff. And even on holidays, we have these great big meals. We as human beings, we love to eat and we love the taste that food um, has we love the comfort that it brings well when she was like the rest of us and during her college years she started cut struggling with her weight you know we all did that freshman 15 you know um and her thing is is her major in college was dietetics well she got an undergraduate degree in that and then she went on to get a master's in food nutrition with an emphasis on biochemistry and according to her church's website after graduation she worked as an instructor of foods and nutrition at the University of Memphis and with the health department there in Memphis so she personally I mean or she kind of just used her personal struggle with her weight as a way to like figure out this weight loss thing so in 1980 she started a weight uh, control consultant practice and her main thoughts And what she shared was that genetics, metabolism, and behavior modification did not explain why some people were thin and others were overweight. Because, you know, we all have that one person we know that can just eat and eat and eat, and they don't seem to gain a pound. But anyway, that was her thought, and she wanted to figure that out. And in 1986, she started this new weight loss program that many people were all excited about, and she called it the Way Down Workshop. Well, this program, it didn't have any food restrictions and no strenuous exercise. They didn't even have weigh-ins. And, you know, I think that's probably what attracted a lot of people because how easy is that? And, you know, a lot of us just don't want to, like, go to these weight loss meetings and weigh in in front of everybody. But her thought on all of this was that dieting made people obsessive about food. So what she taught was for people to transfer their love of food to their love of God. And other experts were concerned about that approach to to getting healthy because they lived by the fact that exercise and healthy eating should be a recommendation that she should be given. But Gwen wanted nothing to do with that. And apparently the people that became her so-called disciples, they didn't want anything to do with that either. Now, Gwen's first class in this workshop was held at a mall in Memphis, but soon she expanded and became based on faith and religion, and the classes were moved to churches. The program consisted of 12 weeks of seminars with audio and video tapes that featured Gwen, and by 1994, 600 churches were participating in this program, and the following year, that number grew to 1,000 churches in 49 states, Great Britain, and Canada. Two years later, that number grew to 5,000. And most of these meetings were taking place in churches, but some people were having them in their homes. Now, this business was growing by leaps and bounds, and I guess it would because it sounded like the end-all, beat-all of of weight loss programs or, or plans. You could eat anything. You didn't have to exercise, and you didn't have to weigh in in front of anybody. By the summer of 1998, 
the headquarters in Franklin, Tennessee, they had a staff of 40 people. They had hosted more than 21,000 classes and had over 250,000 participants worldwide. So, yeah, you could say it was a big deal. And the whole time that Gwen was building this empire, she was using the Christian faith to attract people. I mean, if it's out of church, it must be okay, right? Gwen had been raised in the Church of Christ. And that church is non-denominational and they are highly conservative. And one thing they don't allow is women to hold roles of leadership. Well, Gwen didn't like that and also said that she was being led by God to leave. So she left. And in 1999, Gwen founded the Remnant Fellowship Church in Franklin, Tennessee. And soon they were making plans to build this big, fabulous church. And construction for that big, fabulous church was completed in 2004. And this church, y'all, is had on 40 acres of land that she had purchased in Brentwood, Tennessee. Now, the cool thing about this was that People were actually losing weight and keeping the weight off. And not only were the program's participants losing weight, they were happier and they were more connected to God. And people with mental illnesses like depression and anxiety were finding relief from those too. But it didn't stop at weight loss. The church claims to have freed people from the, their slaveries to drugs, alcohol, cigarettes, overeating, and overspending. And while all of that sounds good, that church also taught that men are like Christ and women are to be submissive. Well, during that time, Gwen also wrote and published a book that became a national bestseller. And that book was called The Way Down Diet. And it was like a workbook companion that went along with the program. And in it, she encouraged people to turn to God and religion for comfort instead of food. She felt that people would be successful by focusing on prayer and other spiritual activities instead of food. And over the following years, she published a total of 14 books, and they were all related to God and weight loss. Well, as you can imagine, with so much success, Gwen was becoming a household name, and she was starting to make her rounds on all the talk shows and, you know, other forms of media. We didn't use the word viral back then, but she and her program had gone viral. And this wasn't just some short-term, here-today, gone-today, one-hit-wonder kind of thing. Remember, this started way back in the 80s. And in 2011, Gwen was hosting her own show online that she called You Can Overcome. Now, it mostly sounds good, right? Well, this is the part where I throw in a plot twist. Not everybody was thrilled with Gwen and all her claims. When she was on Larry King Live on CNN back in 1998, she told Larry that half the money that comes in for the program is sent to the government for their taxes, and the other half goes back into the program, or that it was being used to help people in need. Well, not everybody believed that, though, because many felt that Gwen and her church were making a killing from praying, and that's praying with an E on the vulnerable folks who had put their trust in her, it, it was kind of becoming one of those Jim and Tammy Faye Baker stories that we talked about several months ago. And let's face it, I mean, Gwen owned 18 properties which were worth over a total of $20 million. I mean, she had that big, beautiful church sitting on those 40 acres, a mansion in Brentwood that she named Ashlong, a beach house in Florida. She had another house in Tennessee, and a lot of other properties. So these suspicions of how the money was being used were the least of her worries, though. There was other stuff going on, too. Some of the members of her church had started saying that the organi organization was being very controlling. Some claimed they were mentally damaged, and some even claimed to be abused. The church operated on the thought that the only way you were getting into heaven was by choosing God over food. And the way they saw it was that the skinnier you were, you were more devoted and faithful. And that's my ice maker in the background that you probably hear. But anyway, that's just dangerous. You know, it's bordering on people who have developed these eating disorders and, and mental health issues. One former member was has even been quoted as saying that she needed to just quit eating 
to lose more weight. And the faster you do it, the holier you are. And if that's not bad enough, soon there were allegations of child abuse coming out of the church. One member was told that the way to train her children was, quote, to spank them until they cry or she wasn't spanking them hard enough, end quote. Well, soon after that member was told that, these allegations of abuse really ramped up when a young boy from the church died. And that child was eight years old, and his name was Joseph Smith. And he and his parents, Joseph and Sonia, were members of Gwen's church. And in the investigation that ensued after his death, the parents told investigators they had repeatedly beat little Joseph. During some of those beatings, his hands were tied behind his back, or his older brother had held him down so he wouldn't fight back. Oh my God, that poor little kid. And it, it, it just really floors me what people can do to children. And I'm pretty sure that brother was probably forced to, to do that. And at other times, Joseph would be locked in his room or a closet for extended amounts of time. And he was told to spend his time praying and looking at a picture of Jesus that his parents had put on his ceiling. And on the day that he died, he had received multiple beatings and the autopsy results revealed that his cause of death was head trauma from both sudden and long-term abuse. Joseph and Sonia were charged with first-degree cruelty to children, false imprisonment, aggravated assault, and murder. And according to the Daily Beast, there is an audio recording of Gwen telling the Smiths to use hearth discipline with little Joseph. And the police did believe that the remnant church had influenced their discipline practices, but the parents took it to the extreme. When the case went to trial in 2007, the remnant church paid for the legal Smiths to defend the Smiths, or the, the, the legal fees to defend the Smiths against those charges. And everyone in the church, including Gwen, supported the parents and believed they were innocent. But in the end, the Smiths were found guilty and given life sentences plus 30 years. And the church, though, was never held accountable. Now, Gwen herself received quite a bit of criticism for being what others deemed as hypocrisy. And that hypocrisy was over Gwen's first husband, David. And when she first started her video lessons back in 1980s, David played a major part in them. But as Gwen and the program's popularity grew, David, would, who just happened to be somewhat overweight, was seen less and less in the public eye. But it doesn't end there. She had often spoke out against divorce. And then all of a sudden, Gwen divorced David, who she'd been married to for 40 years. And just as suddenly married a man named Joe Lara. And a former member of her church remembers her saying that she should just suffer through your marriage. Then all of a sudden she's getting a divorce herself. Well, let's fast forward a few years to just last year when HBO decided to do a five-part docuseries based on the church and when. They called it The Way Down, God, Greed, and the Cult of Gwen uh, Shamblin. Now, HBO has spent over three years researching and investigating Gwen and her church, and they were specifically going for the accusations of abuse, harassment, and the toxicity of the whole culture there. Gwen and her staff, they wouldn't respond to anything to do with the series. They just ignored it all. But when the docuseries aired, church, that church released a statement saying that they categorically deny the absurd defamatory statements and accusi accusations made in that documentary, end quote. They also said that the children there in their church was very happy and healthy. Child, get this. Just before the docuseries was finished filming, Gwen and several of her important figures from her church, including her husband, Joe, and her son-in-law, they all died in a plane crash. That was on May 29th of 2021. 
Now, that plane was Gwen's private plane. It was a 1982 Cessna Citation 501, and it had just taken off, and it crashed into Percy Priest Lake in Tennessee. Um, I believe I read that they had only been in the, the air maybe 30 seconds. Um, now, they were flying out to attend a rally that supported former President Donald Trump. The investigation revealed that the plane had only been in the air a minute, when it started its descent. Okay, there it was a minute. I'm sorry. I don't know where I was getting 30 seconds from. But the air controller, air traffic controller, had told them from the tower that um, the plane needed to climb to 3,000 feet. But he never got a confirmation message from the pilot that he had heard it. So it crashed into that lake and it killed everybody on board. And Gwen was 66 at the time that she died. Now, prior to the plane crash, HBO had reached out to former members of Remnant Church, but most of them didn't want to talk. After that plane crash, though, and after her death, many of those people started talking. And they revealed that Gwen not only controlled her followers' diets, okay, that she didn't control just that, and she didn't control just spiritual practices but she also took control of their personal finances how they raised their kids and any activity outside of the church so y'all yeah this was basically a cult under the guise of a church and as far as the weight loss goes one member was told by one of the prominent leaders that she would never get into heaven because she was too fat Now, y'all, that's just body shaming on a whole different level, and it's absolutely disgusting. Now, you would think that since Gwen was so involved with her church, she would have left a fortune to it in her will. But guess what? She didn't leave a penny to that church. But y'all, that church is still functioning, and it was passed down to Gwen's children, Elizabeth and Mike. Now, Elizabeth has taken her mom's role in the church, and in a statement, Elizabeth said that she is happy to have, quote, the wonderful opportunity to follow in my mother's footsteps and serve in our beautiful church. And I'm grateful for her example of decades of laying her life down for others, end quote. And so what's happened to Brother Michael? Well, he's been removed as a leader from the church's website, and he hasn't issued any public statements. And if I was him, I would like run like the wind and change my name so y'all to me this story just goes to show how money can change a person and in this case it was for the worse uh, i believe in the beginning she probably had good intentions and it just started spiraling out of control it's like the richer she got the more she wanted she wanted more money she wanted more power and we see a lot that people will use religion as a way to lure in people because they think, hey, it's faith-based. It has to be legit. And people did lose weight, which is awesome, but soon that got to be out of control too because of the philosophy that you had to be skinny to get to heaven and that the faster you lost weight, the more dedicated to God you were. I've said it before. I know I'll say it again, but I'm saying it now. I don't understand how someone can get so sucked in by another person that they lose control and give it to a person or that person that sucked them in. And these people were letting that church tell them to beat their children, to starve themselves, to give them their money. And I like to think that I'm too hard headed for that. And my BS detector is sensitive to such stuff. But fortunately, I've never been in a situation for something like that to happen. And I hope I'm never in this situation. Um, but anyway, that's really all for tonight's episode. And I hope y'all have like the best weekend ever. Um, don't forget to come back on Monday. Because on Monday, I'm starting a mini series on the Murdochs here in South Carolina. Um, unless you've been living under a rock, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Y'all have a good night. And... Keep it weird. <laughs>